2023 was heralded as a good year for gaming. I wasn't impressed, mostly because people were talking about game remasters as being some of the best games. Once again, the mid-2000s outcompeting the modern day, while not even acknowledging games like Battlebit. I guess in fairness, Battlebit was also a remaster, albeit as a misnomer, as the remaster was of the earlier, rougher development versions. 2024 has been more impressive to me already, and we're only a couple months in. Helldivers 2 is not even the first game to come out this year that I've really enjoyed. With an asterisk. It should be said that despite the massive red flag it puts up, that everything else about this game has to be really good to bear that weight and still come out on top. Chances are I don't even need to tell you to play this game because you already have. This is what a successful game launch looks like. Let's start with the gameplay, since that's the most important part. The game is a third-person shooter with drop-in co-op of up to four players. It plays like a mix of a ton of different games I really like, notably scratching my Battlefront 2 itch. It has a really nice control system to make playing it smooth, but what really sells it for me is the stancing and diving. You can dive through the air in this game, but you can also shoot omnidirectionally while flying through the air, as well as throw grenades. Then when you're on the ground, you can roll around on your back. Stancing has a gameplay consideration for aiming, and diving has downsides to make it a tactical decision. Pushing the higher difficulties really requires you to know how your character handles, because knowing when to not dive is just as important as knowing how to best use diving. My only complaints about the system are that you can't jump at will, and you can only vault contextually or dive to the ground. Jumping and diving are two different concepts, and I'm not really sure why the devs would need to be scared of player vertical mobility, considering the AI is more than capable of handling the player climbing up on objects, star feet. Which leads into the next slice of gameplay, stratagems. See, while you do play as a shock troop unit, you are responsible for organizing strike missions to help mitigate the overwhelming hordes of enemies you have to fight. Stratagems come in a few flavors to help you out. Sentries for defense, support weapons to augment your fighting abilities, and strike missions for offense. These are input through a series of directional commands, which is another good idea. See, I've played a lot of Arma 3 recon operations, which are structured pretty similar in terms of missions. However, Arma 3 has a Byzantine menu system where you input a couple of numbers to call in fire missions. This game is taking that idea and making it a consistent, easily learnable mechanic. Sure, you could macro them, if you're a loser. The inputs really give the game a lot of flavor, to the point that you can say up, right, down, 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 and players would know what you're referring to. Like diving, stratagems are another part of the skill curve between good and bad players. You have to know which stratagems work in what scenarios, consider what the rest of your team is bringing in, and know exactly how to call it in to get the best effect and not kill your teammates. And since we've mentioned it, Helldivers 2 is a co-op game. You can do missions solo if you want, but the game mechanically rewards cooperation, even with randos on the internet. That didn't stop some people from developing unnecessary metas, but we'll talk about that in a bit. The game is finally balanced around four-player co-op, without room for PvP or larger scale game modes. I'm talking in terms of basic mechanics, mission structure, map layouts, difficulty ratings, it's all tuned around four people. The game is built pretty well to encourage working together, resources are shared, there are mechanics for complementary loadouts, and you can only play the most efficiently in a group, but the cooperative mechanics are so natural that you don't even have to be in comms with the rest of your team to have successful mission outcomes, because working together is truly easier than trying to compete. The designs of the enemies are also good at creating synergy. Right now there are two factions, bugs and bots. Bugs are a massive melee swarm with a few ranged units, while bots are the inverse. It meant that I could bounce between these two enemies to keep the game fresh because each expects different things of the players. And the aesthetics of the factions are strong. Helldivers 2 has a strong art style and sense of aesthetics, so much so that it reignited an annoying internet discourse about satire. The bugs have a clean art style to easily communicate enemy ranks and threat level just through color and animation. Doesn't matter how many swarm you, one glance and you can instantly know the disposition of the enemy force and how you need to deal with it. The bots are similarly straightforward but making more use of silhouettes and lighting. You can instantly tell, even in low visibility environments, what type of bot is looking at you. It also means that you can easily pick out what is an enemy and what is your fellow player, minimizing potential friendly fire. 
And of course, you have the design of the titular Helldivers. A useful feature are that we have capes as part of our uniforms. So it doesn't matter how far players stray away from the black and yellow uniform, because nothing else has a cape except for your allies. But that's all on the gameplay side. Our ships are great, with a really strong aesthetic for the kind of culture Super Earth has. Super Earth as a concept sounds really over the top on paper with the satire, but the game wears it so earnestly that players can identify with the concepts as part of the joke, while still understanding that the setting is a dystopia. Most science fiction writers that are that blatant with their authoritarian overtones couldn't even come close to the effectiveness of this game in relaying the downsides of the system without having characters spend dozens of minutes beating you over the head with the symbolism. Surviving missions is not an objective. You're almost immediately replaced as soon as you die with an identically brainwashed soldier. Rewards for extracting Helldivers are extremely paltry, to the point that if you aren't bringing any samples home, there really isn't a mechanical purpose of extracting alive. Because obviously the system puts a higher priority on securing research samples than it does on rescuing its own soldiers. The in-game television ads are cheesy, while still making you willing to salute and fight for managed democracy. And what a lot of the media literacy video essay folks won't get is that just as the game is presenting all of this ironically, players are also going along with the message ironically. Nobody's going to walk away from this game saying, yeah, I want to live in a system that throws human lives away on this scale. I'm going to endorse this in the real world. I mean, someone will. You can't account for all the microplastics and lead poisoning from Stanley Cups. It really is incredible how much more functional this science fiction setting is when it calls its homeworld Super Earth just through small environmental and mechanical details, compared to a setting that has 250,000 lines of spoken dialogue and spends all of its time telling the player about the setting. The enemies have similar world-building strengths. I mean, the bugs are just bugs, but they still did a good job with how the terminated structures look and selling the idea of how these bugs are able to field these massive armies. The automatons are a pretty great faction. They look like pieces of construction equipment that decided to start being a menace to society. Their camps are brutal military fortifications. They patrol with a marching chant and a commissar. They are just a classic silicon enemy force. But they aren't a mindless silicon swarm. That's for the bugs to do. Their niche is that they're an intelligent fighting force with propaganda and recruitment. And as an intelligent fighting force, they're more than capable of shooting back at us. It really is a clever little sci-fi setting that draws obvious inspirations while still trying to do its own thing and remembering that this world is in service of gameplay rather than leaving gameplay as an afterthought to focus on questing experiences. And speaking of, how do missions work in this game? Helldivers 2 doesn't have a traditional pre-baked campaign storyline. Instead, your campaign experience is entirely dictated by your participation in the Galactic War. This is a broad, overarching campaign being played by everybody who plays. Because, uh, well, this is a live service game. That's why they have kernel-level anti-cheat and why the servers being full meant people couldn't play, even single player. Yeah, that's the red flag. I know some Zoomers in my audience might not get why people dislike this, because you've grown up with this stuff, but it used to be that if the servers for a game were full, you could still play the game's single player content. Here, everything is reliant on a central server, meaning that while it is successful now, there's zero guarantee you'll be able to play this game that you paid for in 20 years. The grand campaign stuff doesn't seem interesting enough yet to merit playing a game with a noose already tied around its neck. The galaxy is divided into sectors, and you can only do missions on planets and sectors currently under attack or enemy control. Missions you do seem to contribute to a war effort on that planet, but I cannot say that with certainty as the system was probably overwhelmed by the sheer number of players doing missions while I was playing. You cannot play planets at will, which is a shame as most of them look quite nice, which, by the way, are also procedurally generated. What's that? Procedurally generated planet slices that make for interesting grounds for missions? Where have I heard that before? Yeah, Starfield. I am still mad about this game, and I still think people who think the problem is not a poor usage of proc gen, but procedural generation in general are wrong. Helldivers 2 is a game with the exact same approach to area design, and guess what? It's amazing. You can make the idea work as long as you have compelling gameplay and missions. The way missions work is that, based on your difficulty rating, it places down an objective and a number of sub and side objectives. The higher the difficulty, the more you're expected to accomplish in the same time frame. It also places down a variety of enemy bases. 
While for most of my playtime I did these for resources, even once those resources had hit the cap I would still clear out bases because enemies that spawned at a base would wander over to the nearby objectives making them harder to complete. You control where you drop in and are given warnings if you're dropping into a safe area or the middle of enemy territory. You call in your support equipment and start going around the map completing objectives. You can roll with a squad to tackle the tougher objectives or split up to cover more of the area. You're incentivized to do both, meaning you have to make a choice. Take the risk of losing items by dying alone, but potentially complete the mission quicker, or stay with the squad, ensuring you can complete objectives, but taking longer to do so. I love it. It's great. Mission's primary objectives are gated in a progression. For example, before you can launch an ICBM, you need to get the launch codes. On higher difficulty, you may also have to fuel the missile and turn on the power. And you can only extract with your samples once you launch the missile, meaning that you're always pushing to complete those objectives for reasons beyond just completing content. Side objectives are exactly that. Some of them are just for experience and don't provide tangible rewards. Others provide help for your current mission. An example would be the artillery piece, which once completed becomes a stratagem. Which shells it uses in what order are even determined by the players who do the objective, but aren't told until after you call it in. Meaning, if you aren't communicating, you might get a mini nuke to kill a bile titan and you might get a harmless cloud of smoke. I love these side objectives and I hope they add more that affect the missions. For example, maybe a seismic noisemaker that draws bug patrols away when activated as a stratagem and reduces the number of bug spawns passively. Objectives are generally consistent. You're either blowing something up or using a terminal, which uses the same DDR minigame that stratagems use. Which, given you have to do this while either being swarmed by bugs or shot at, means you either need good timing, luck, or teammates to complete. Overall, despite using the same canned objectives, I never actually got bored doing any of the missions. Missions exist within multi-step operational campaigns, so you have to complete a set of missions to get bigger rewards, rather than playing missions individually. Which means we need to talk progression. What exactly is the carrot this game uses to motivate players? Well, obviously a progression system. I find it funny some people hate progression systems on principle being put into all kinds of games when even OG Battlefront had a broader progression system that would augment you for crossing thresholds. Progress in Helldivers 2 goes through research and requisitions. Requisition slips are a currency used to unlock new stratagems, and stratagems are level gated. It doesn't take long to hit level 20, which ungates all the stratagems, and not much longer to have enough slips to buy all of them. At least, that's the case if you can push higher difficulties. This has an unfortunate effect of biasing players towards playing bugs, because bugs on difficulty 8 are as difficult as bots on difficulty 6 which meant that nobody was really engaging with the general order to fight the automatons. It didn't help that apparently people are just farming missions and failing, which contributes to the automatons war score. Granted, like I said, it doesn't take particularly long to get the slips needed to buy any stratagems you want. And once you have all of them, there isn't anything to spend your slips on and they max out at 50,000. Levels have a similar max. There's not much point to being above 20 and it caps at 50. I do think it's interesting that there is a max level cap, considering a lot of games like this don't have one just so that players know how long a person's been playing if they're like level 200. Experience and requisition slips, the primary carrot of clearing some areas, stop having incentives at the max levels. Granted, because this is a co-op game, I was always playing with newer people, so I still had an incentive to do it to help them level instead, but it was disappointing running out of this part of the progression so quickly. The next part is upgrading the ship by collecting research samples. It's not a research system. You are basically just being given additional funding by proving your usefulness to Super Earth by bringing back samples they can use in their research projects. These are the samples I've referred to throughout this video. It's a longer form of progression that I'm still pushing even as of writing. Part of that is that samples are rarer, not guaranteed to be part of completing objectives, and are dropped when you die. Meaning if someone's running around picking up everybody else's samples off their corpses and then dies right before extraction, you're not bringing any samples home. Yes, that did happen to me. But still, it's a good system for actually encouraging players to try to extract because the paltry bonus for bringing everyone home isn't. You need this kind of progression to get even the sweatiest of players to play along with the missions and not just frag themselves as soon as the objectives are complete. And speaking of the sweaties, some players didn't know that samples are shared between the entire squad and 
were team killing to steal samples because they thought it would increase their sample counts faster. No amount of genius mechanical design can account for everyone. The progression comes with passive benefits that almost all upgrade your stratagems in some way. They are also very obvious with what they upgrade and how, listing affected stratagems and giving clear numbers on what their effect is supposed to be. The final longest form of progression has to do with the live service part of the game, the battle pass. I don't like live service games, and I definitely don't like battle passes. This one is mostly inoffensive and completely doable through just playing. No additional real-world money is needed. What I'm saying comes from a good place, I'm not trying to tear down the game for this, but simply point out that the foundation is built on quicksand and I'd rather not watch it sink. The game has two passes, a standard permanent one that contains essential weapons and a decent selection of cosmetic items, and a premium battle pass. You can buy the premium battle pass with real money, but the currency you need to buy it is also attainable from missions and the standard battle pass. I was able to purchase the premium battle pass through super credits I earned just by playing the game around the same time I hit 50,000 requisition slips, and I hadn't even completed the standard pass at that point. So even though some of the premium items are superior, it's not really pay to win, nor is it particularly predatory as it has been stated that it's intended to be available forever. But this is still a live service game, meaning the terms can be changed whenever Sony feels like it. The developers seem like fairly honest people and the inclusion of live service components just seems to be part of Sony's broader strategy to make more live service games, but that doesn't mean the current system's gonna stay that way. Remember, they control your continued access to this product. If they decide that next year they want the game to have predatory microtransactions, they can do that. If the Battle Pass was just an innocuous progression system, it easily could have also been made to work offline as a standard research tree. I only give my endorsement to play this game on the condition that it remains a static product. Given that it's a service, they can completely change it and make the parts I like non-existent. It's happened before. There is also a cosmetic shop of rotating items, only paid for by the premium currency. You can get this currency in increments of 10, found throughout the missions, usually a couple times per mission, and most of these items tend to be priced around the 150 to 250 credit range. So it doesn't take much to earn enough credits to be able to buy the occasional armor piece. Credits are generally priced at 1 per penny, with some bonuses to buying them in bulk. The problem I have is that Armor in Helldivers is not just cosmetic, it has stats and effects on it. For example, this armor I'm wearing could only be purchased for a limited time in the premium store, and contains a bonus for throwing range, but is also light armor. There is no light armor in the battle pass that boosts throwing range. So if you didn't play that day or didn't have enough premium currency, enjoy having worse armor than me. So far, I haven't seen any other types of gameplay affecting items listed in the limited time store. These would be, for example, weapons, grenades, and boosters. Despite being called boosters in a live service game, they aren't actually limited time. They are basically just passive stratagems that affect the entire team. It's another mechanical consideration to make for co-op, and I welcome them. Weapons and grenades are unlocked through the battle pass. The premium pass does have items that I would consider to be advantageous over their normal variations. Some will say it's not pay to win because you can earn them, and there is not a competitive win state for Helldivers 2. However, I'd still say they are pay to win because these premium items can help you push the difficulty much sooner, enabling you to progress through the game faster. I doubt it's lost on the devs that sweaty players will pay to get these kinds of advantages sooner. Again, if I thought the devs were being completely good faith, this would be a standard research system with no slot for a credit card. I don't think it's their fault either, just a corporate mandate from their publisher that this needs to be a live service game. And that brings us to another ugly part of the game, item stats. These are completely busted and I generally don't trust them. For example, there are multiple medium armor penetrating weapons that are listed as light armor penetrating. This helmet in the battle pass has a hidden effect that makes you run faster at the cost of armor. Doesn't say this outright, you have to notice that your armor stats are different. And speaking of armor, the armor rating was broken when I played for a couple weeks. This meant armor wasn't actually doing anything, which meant that everyone was not only extremely brittle, but also that light armor was superior because its entire design is about lowering your armor rating in exchange for speed. And this had a huge knock-on effect. Because the event was bots, people were getting destroyed by one-shot rockets because they had zero armor rating to help them. That's how the... meta formed.
Yep, this co-op PvE shooter has a meta, and people were even getting kicked for not using it. Skill issue. This never happened to me because I always hosted. I can't say it was a pervasive problem, and there were plenty of people who were using whatever they wanted for fun, but yeah, let's talk about the Helldivers meta game. At level 20, you unlock the Personal Shield Stratagem. This is your only reliable defensive measure in a game where the armor rating is bugged. It's also the only backpack slot to not come with a downside beyond taking up the backpack slot that could be used by other support equipment. Let's see, am I going to carry spare ammo for my teammates who won't need it, or am I going to carry a bubble shield that will be the difference between life and death? Hmm, yeah, it was bad. I tried using other backpack slot items and they were either just all right or garbage. For example, I saw a decent number of people using the drone, and it does do work on clearing small enemies automatically, but it will also friendly fire you if you turn too sharply. The jetpack was bad. It's only useful if you're going down hills rather than up them. You can't shoot in midair, and it makes an extremely annoying noise while recharging for a long time. The ballistic shield was fun because it could be comboed with a primary SMG, but the personal shield is literally superior because it does the same thing, but omnidirectionally, and does not limit what weapons you can use. The personal shield meta also invalidated weapons that rewarded team reloads. This is a really cool mechanic. Basically, you can use a weapon like the autocannon while a teammate with the backpack reloads it for you. That's not valid when everyone needs a backpack shield. The next piece of meta bling was the railgun. Again, why use the autocannon as a team when two people could use two railguns? It was also just superior, especially against some of the more annoying enemies. I would use a lot of support weapons that weren't the railgun, and that basically meant I could not kill chargers by myself without using all of my ammo. Meanwhile, railguns can consistently kill them in a few shots. The railgun shield combo basically invalidated most of the support equipment as a result. My personal favorites were the stalwart and the grenade launcher, which at least served functions useful to a team otherwise using railguns. Since the railgun's only real downside is not being able to kill swarms. I think once armor's fixed, they can probably pretty easily get support weapons into a good position where there's an incentive to have a squad using a diverse selection of equipment. So let's talk about sentries. Fun, but kind of bad. It especially didn't help that defense missions where they shine were bugged and spawning way more enemies than intended. When two of your stratagem slots are already filled with a railgun and a personal shield, you have to be careful with what your other two are going to be. Because sentries have a higher cooldown time, it means that shorter cooldown stratagems are simply more reliable. Am I going to gamble on an autocannon turret that might get killed from behind due to its slow turn speed? Or am I going to use the more reliable airstrike that have multiple uses and cools down faster? And that leaves us with the offensive stratagems, orbital strikes, and eagle airstrikes. The general balance is that eagle missions have multiple uses before needing to rearm, while the orbital strikes have a consistent cooldown per use. Unlike the other stratagems, there is a decent case to be made about having a diverse selection of stratagems based on the situation. For example, the orbital railgun cannot one-shot bile titans, but it can kill bot tanks. On the flip side, the Eagle 500kg bomb can one-shot a Bile Titan, but it's not useful on bots or swarms of enemies. 11,000 pounds of bombs. That's some serious shock and all. The Orbital Laser is really good, but its hefty cooldown means it's better for only one or two people to bring in case of emergencies. I really like that. There isn't as big of a meta for picking these stratagems. Squad diversity is important, and it shows the potential support equipment has as a system once they can make that diverse as well. Helldivers 2 is a well-made video game. Its Achilles heel will be in its nature as a live service game. There's a reason I can still talk about Battlefront 2005 without needing a $35 re-release that's apparently going to be 56 gigabytes. With an announced end-of-life plan, this video is a time capsule of something future generations will not get to experience. Even those of us who have and will experience it will be affected by decisions made during its lifespan. I'll never get to play Year One Siege ever again, even though it's still technically available. It's all too common for corporations to buy the Golden Egg Factory and decide that they can finally get rid of the goose. All it takes is for a couple people to be fired and Helldivers 2 of 2025 will be unrecognizable. It's happened before, it'll happen again. Either play it now or make it clear you won't play it until an offline DRM-free version is made available. Because this is absolutely a game I want people in 20 years to be able to still play.
Thanks to the patrons for supporting this project. They help keep these videos independent. This is the kind of video I wanted to get back to making, so hopefully it's a good mix of telling you about the game, but also having a few analytical nuggets. I wasn't actually even considering doing this video initially, hence me not recording the first 20 or so hours that I played. However, it coincided with me finally concluding the major part of recording for WoW Classic. Yes, I was still doing that from before Christmas to after Valentine's Day. That video is a huge project, so hopefully there's going to be more of these little side projects this year to help prevent any kind of writer's block I will get from working on that bigger video. Also, hopefully preventing another 2023 situation where I only make four videos in a year. The other good game I played this year was Enshrouded. I played that before Helldivers, so I may or may not make a video about it. I have the footage, but I'm not sure if I want to write a script for it or just move on to other games that I want to do. It's a survival game, so it's worth checking out if that's the kind of game you're into. Requesting advanced weapons. 